Hello, my name is Dana M. Peterson. I am the new Chief Economist at the Conference Board. Prior to joining the Conference Board, I spent 18 years as a North America and Global Economist at City. In a collaborative effort, City Research produced a seminal report titled Closing the Racial Inequality Gaps. The report was written in response to the social unrest linked to the deaths of several Black Americans in police custody and the economic fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, racial economic gaps in the U.S. are nothing new. They have existed for decades, often stemming from policies and actions with roots with, from more than 100 years ago. However, in more recent times, the focus on closing these gaps has shifted from being a moral imperative to an economic and business imperative. In a recent study conducted by Citi, we discovered that the U.S. economy has lost out on at least $16 trillion over the last 20 years due to racial economic caps. $16 trillion is more than China and India's real GDP in a year combined. This amount is derived by examining the cost of gaps in wages, home ownership, education, and business access to capital. All of these gaps contribute to the sizable wealth gaps between racial groups. The racial wealth gap, or the gap between wages earned by women or persons of color and white males has not improved. If the wage gap between black women and white men were closed 20 years ago, then $2.7 trillion in additional income could have been generated. Some of the wage gap is caused by occupational segmentation, but education is also a major factor. In K through 12 schools with non-white students tend to receive less funding than schools with majority white students. This can affect one's ability to receive advanced degrees or training. We estimated that if the same percentage of black persons obtained advanced degrees as white persons in the US, then bolstered lifetime incomes for black workers could sum to 90 to $113 billion. A major determinant of wealth is whether one owns a home. Black persons are the least likely racial group to own a home in the US. This is due to lack of access to mortgages, affordable housing, and poor credit often linked to use of alternative banking services. If some of these problems were alleviated, then there might be an additional 770,000 Black homeowners. The sum of the home purchases, plus spending on items associated with a home, could have accumulated $218 billion over the last 20 years. Meanwhile, Black entrepreneurs are least likely to receive financing for their businesses. Moreover, at every stop along the financing spectrum, they are more likely to receive less financing than requested. Much of this has been linked to bias rather than lack of effort or expertise on the part of the entrepreneur. If the lending gap were closed 20 years ago, then there might have been $13 trillion in business revenue accumulated and 6 million additional jobs created per year. The panel that follows this presentation will delve more deeply into the ways in which financial institutions, including Citi, are attempting to close this $13 trillion Black business financing gap. If these four racial economic gaps are closed immediately, then over the next five years, we might see nearly five trillion in additional dollars created in the US. This might add nearly one half percentage point to US GDP every year at a time when we are continuing to recover from the devastation of the pandemic. The time to act on closing racial gaps is now. So take action. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. These magnitudes are staggering. What we have just heard should disturb and shock everyone in this country. As I wrote in my New York Times column last November, we can count it in lost patents and innovation which undergird GDP or directly as GDP as Dana has done. But racism cost everyone in this economy, albeit unevenly. We have here today a distinguished panel to pick up on the theme of fair and equitable lending, which Dana mentions. First, we have Harold Butler, Managing Director of City in Washington, DC. Cynthia Day, President and CEO of Citizens Trust in Atlanta. And Harold Pettigrew, CEO of the Washington Area Community Investment Fund. Welcome to you all. I am going to start with a few questions for 
the panel. They'll introduce themselves first, but we encourage you throughout their, uh, your time here to post questions to the Q&A box. So panelists, please introduce yourselves. That sounds good. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so I'm Harold Butler, uh, as, as uh, Lisa indicated, a city group. Uh, you know, for the last four years, City has had a very deliberate focus on the minority banking community. Certainly following the horrific murder of George Floyd, our city CEO challenged the leadership at City to begin to, to look at ways that we could, could do and have a larger role in changing the dynamic. And it really began with the very research that Dana just took us through. We know the why. Understanding fully the impacts of the why led us to the what. That call to action, defining the what, if you will, led us to the Action for Racial Equity Initiative inside City, which is a billion dollar commitment to help close the racial wealth gap in America. Now, just, just to be clear, it's not about philanthropy. This is about or operationalizing racial equity. So you might say, what does that mean? Well, it means for us providing greater access to banking and credit in communities of color. It means increasing investments in Black-owned business and expanding home ownership among Black Americans. And it means leading, being out front, advancing the anti-racist practices in the financial services industry. So, this has been my personal passion, and I've had the pleasure of leading it, our engagement with the MDI community at City for over the last four years. So well, thank you. I'm just honored to be a part of this panel and, and this discussion uh, around such an important topic, such as closing the right, uh, wealth gap. Uh, Citizens Trust Bank was founded in 1921. Uh, we'll be 100 years old this year. We're about 570 million with a footprint in Alabama and, and Georgia with a digital footprint across the nation. We were built and founded on being able to confront and be a part of some of the solutions uh, to, and be a solution to some of the obstacles that we're talking about today. And our focus is had been on and still is on providing access to capital for businesses. And we believe that you provide access to capital that creates jobs. When you create jobs, then that affords for better educational systems and then access to healthcare within the communities. And we know that this healthy ecosystem will provide for home ownerships. And when you have thriving and growing businesses, then you have sustainable uh, and thriving communities and families. That was our mission in 1921. And that's our mission today. And we're excited about the opportunity to create awareness and to forge partnerships um, like companies like City to expand this impact and drive solutions that we know will create meaningful change. Thank you, Cynthia. Harold P. Thank you, Lisa. Um, it's truly a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Harold Pettigrew and I serve as the CEO for the Washington Area Community Investment Fund, also known as WACIF. Now, WACIF is a 34 year old uh, organization in the Washington DC metropolitan region and for 34 years, uh, we have, as an organization, uh, have invested uh, across a spectrum of community need, from childcare to affordable housing, uh, to, uh, uh, to schools, uh, you name it, we, we've had some investment throughout our history. What our role has been over the last five years, however, is to lean into uh, investing in small business, uh, positioning our brand uh, to be a small business development corporation, investing in those, investing in entrepreneurs, those who are creating jobs, those who are the anchors uh, for our communities across the region. What's been important for us, um, and those statistics, as you mentioned, Lisa, are really startling. Um, and, and those statistics are, are just the same in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. And what's been important for us is that we stand in opposition to those statistics, that we took intentional steps to make sure that racial equity was at the center of our work and making sure that as we invest in communities, we're bringing the fullness of what we can do as an organization to address uh, the racial wealth gap uh, in the region. And so as a lender, uh, we are part of a larger network of what's called Community Development Financial Institutions, or CDFIs. 
Uh, across the country, there's roughly 1,100, or a little over 1,100 CDFIs, all doing the work uh, to invest uh, in, in communities where banks either can't or won't invest in, in certain areas. And CDFIs as a whole uh, account for over $220 billion of assets under management. Uh, WACF is an organization. Uh, our focus has been in the DC region um, and our work has been critical and made catalytic through uh, investments from city and, and, and institutions like it doing this type of work. And so uh, for our work at WACF uh, being central to uh, focus on entrepreneurship, uh, we lend and provide capital with specific focus on entrepreneurs of color uh, through three strategic investment pillars. Uh, the first being inclusive entrepreneurship, the second community wealth building, and the third being equitable uh, economic development. Thank you, Harold P. As you can see, I am calling them Harold P and Harold B <laughs> because we have uh, an excess of Harold's here today. And that's, that's a blessing. So thank you, thank you so much. I'm gonna start with Cynthia and ask the question about what has been helpful in your organization in promoting fair and equitable lending? What has worked in your organization? Lisa, that's an interesting question for us because being an MDI and a CDFI, I like to say that Everything we do is surrounding those tenants about closing the, the um, wealth gap. That's what we were founding on uh, and, and that's what we continue to do. Some of the things that we focus on, we, we call it our tenants of, of our existence. And we talked a little bit about the access to capital. Um, well, 90% of our loans are to minority businesses, black businesses, families, churches within our community. 90% of the mortgages that we make are to black families to help realize the dream of home ownership. And we understand that that's part of that wealth uh, accumulation. And so those are the things we focus on. We focus on education. Um, we, we, we started with um, the middle and high school kids. We've touched over 9,000 kids around the schools in our footprint because we feel like we need to get to um, the kids earlier so that we can teach them healthy financial habits uh, and money matters. Um, we put this inside of their curriculums, inside of their schools, so that it becomes a part of uh, their educational process. And we think that's important. Uh, other things that we do is um, we really focus on home buying um, to teach people how to enter the home buying market and what things that banks are looking for you know, what they need to do. There are times when we'll wait, work with customers six months in order to get their credit reports right so they can enter into um, the dream of home ownership. And obviously um, access to capital for businesses. We do financial symposiums because a lot of businesses, you know, don't, aren't as sophisticated. Doesn't mean that they're not successful. Um, they run successful businesses, but just access to the information and the support that our organization can provide in helping them understand how to build a, a, a banking relationship, what things we need. I mean, sometimes we uh, have banks speak and we think that everybody understands that language, but it's not necessarily true. Doesn't mean that their businesses aren't successful, but they need our help and they need our time uh, to be able to help walk them through that. Something else I think is also important is, you know, how do we look at credit worthiness? Um, and that's to all of our, our, our banks is just trying to understand that there's different perspectives. Uh, there's different cultural dis differences about how, um, you know, people, uh, how financially sophisticated they are. Doesn't mean that they're not a good risk and it doesn't mean that they don't have successful businesses. And we just gotta make sure that we're having the conversations that are inclusive, that we get the right perspectives uh, in order to solve uh, these problems. Thank you, Cynthia. Yes. We've heard from a minority deposit institution. She mentioned an MDI, that's what it is, and a CDFI. Uh, Harold B., let's move to you. We want to hear from one of the largest banks, if not the largest bank in the country, uh, a systemically important financial institution. What has been helpful? What has worked in your organization? What's been very helpful 
is, and we believe is the right thing to do, of course, is to make these equity investments in the minority deposit institutions such that they can be of greater assistance to the underrepresented communities they serve. That's important. We all should be doing it. But, but we believe there's a much greater need. And our focus is really on, as I like to say, the long game, right? And that's creating long-term sustainable revenue generating opportunities. That to me is really the heartbeat of, of the way our DNA now is shaped around supporting this industry. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like up to $50 million, for example, in loan participation opportunities, maybe for affordable housing and other types of things, other types of opportunities from some of our clients. It looks like credit assignments from working with some of our clients. It looks like technical assistance, training, uh, and, and advice in collaboration with partners like Deloitte uh, and even internal people and other folks that we work with here at City. Uh, it's, it's looking at ways that we can help make an impact on the next generation of bankers, right? To, and I remember having a conversation with Cynthia some time ago, and she said, you know, Harold, you know, we have to make sure that one day I'd like to retire, that one day we have people, young men and women that are interested in a mission-oriented type of atmosphere, much of which many of the MDIs are focused on. Uh, in the communities they serve. And we wanna be able to get that talent into you know, Citizens uh, Trust Bank. And so, and I think that is a prevailing win throughout the entire MDI community. So we're working to look at talent acquisition and working with partners like Prep for Prep in New York. Bottom line is everything we're doing is extremely uh, informed by the banks that we work with. It, if it's not important to them, then it's not important to us. And we've learned as a financial institution, you know, how to connect those dots better, I think, because we're working with banks like Cynthia's to, to be able to make an impact directly into the communities. Thank you, Harold P. Harold P., what about in your organization? What has been helpful? What has worked? And thanks for that, Lisa. I think there's a, there's a number of things that, uh, are part of the, the recipe. You know, when, when we, we put our flag in the ground uh, about how we would invest um, in our, our local region uh, and what was at, at the center of that, again, was, was racial equity. Um, and so one of the things that empowered us to be able to do so, um, and just to call out Harold's point about the intentionality um, is having longstanding partners like City, you know, who's invested in our work um, and provided the fuel for us to do on the ground what we do best. Um, and so what that's translated into is uh, 2018, 100% of our lending was to entrepreneurs of color. Um, and roughly 95% of that was to, to black owned businesses. And in, in 2019, uh, it was roughly 96%. And in 2020, even through the challenging times that we dealt with, uh, similarly, over 90% of our loans were to entrepreneurs of color. And so for us, it was first just being intentional, calling out that where we have issues uh, of, of the racial wealth divide, in our region that we're intentional about how we drive our investments. Um, and so that, that's what's been the anchor for, uh, for, for what we do and what's proven uh, successful in our investment philosophy. Thank you, Harold P. For the next round of questions, I would like to combine the, uh, the question of metrics and how do we know when we're done? Because in my view, we can only know when we're done when the metrics say we're done. So let's start with you, uh, Harold B. How do we know when we're done? What are you measuring to say you're done or you've done better, there's been progress? So I'd like to begin, in fact, with that question. And I love that question because uh, as we say here in City, what's, what's measured gets done. Uh, and this is a philosophy, it's part of our DNA at City. And so, you know, when I think about the work that we're doing um, with the MDI banks and, and firms like Harold's um, is, you know, I, I, I think about the fact that our business leadership is engaged, right? And that's critical because that's where the opportunities will come from inside of our business. And they're accountable for the commitments that we make to the community of CDFIs and MDIs that uh, we work with. Uh, we measure ourselves, Lisa, 
on the yardstick of engagement, frankly, right? So are the MDIs and CDFIs getting involved? And are we creating goals that make sense and, and achieving those goals, right? When our partnerships with the banks, for example, tell us that, hey, we've got new revenue in that we've never seen before, or we're, we're opening up new doors of opportunities for some of the banks to get involved in, as I like to say, new swim lanes of, of creating um, new opportunities. Or if they tell us that, you know, in the communities that we serve, the underrepresented now understand or, are, or have opportunities to generate and create wealth. Businesses are getting loans, et cetera. Then I'd say to you, frankly, that those are, those are examples of, I think, hitting the high mark of success, as I like to call it. I do not believe that we will, I, I hope very personally that, you know, when is it done? Well, I hope that the making it a level playing field making it such that, you know, financial institutions, black financial institutions have access to the capital markets, that it, it becomes the norm, right? And, and being able to then say and see the empowerment that's happening in the communities. I don't know, I'd like to not even think about it ever being done. I'd like to just see us get to a sense of, as we say in banking par, where there's a level playing field in the banks and the communities have an opportunity to do things on the same level as everyone else and then achieve those same levels of success. So, you know, we're, we're in it for the long game. I said earlier that our big focus is all about sustainable long term growth. Um, I don't have I don't see an end game at all, personally. Right. I see opportunities for us to to help banks like Cynthia become billion dollar financial institutions. Right, because when you're when you're that size, you can impact the communities that you serve in a much greater way. So that's sort of my little crystal ball of how I look at it. Okay, thank you, Harold P. Same question. Uh, yes, and thank you, Lisa. So that that's a that's a challenging one. I think uh, similar to Harold Butler, uh, you know, we we take the same a, a long view, um, but anchoring it in our mission. Um, and one of the challenges that we do have um, in the DC area specifically, and this is pre-COVID, we knew that uh, the, the, the racial wealth divide uh, was pretty stark uh, in the city where white households had 81 times more uh, of, of value in their net worth than black households. That was pre-COVID. And so what that means is that the road is long. Um, and so I don't know what the, 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 the end game is other than to say to Harold's point where, you know, par accounts for how we see wealth in our communities and that that racial wealth divide uh, no longer exists. And we, we have a pretty long road ahead of us, uh, particularly when accounting for the impacts of COVID, um, where we know uh, specifically related to small business, but this accounts for home ownership as well. Uh, we've had some disastrous numbers for the number of failures of businesses, particularly black businesses, or the uh, loss of revenues uh, within a given within uh, 2020 and, and entering into 2021, and what that's translated into is the loss of jobs, um, and so an, also an impact uh, to the net worth uh, of our communities as well. Um, and we're looking at a recovery period at least for the next year or two. You know, so we we have some uh, some ways to go, uh, but the commitment is there uh, to make sure that we can close the gap. Thank you, Harold P. Cynthia, what about you? That's a, that's a wonderful question and, and a very complex one as well. Um, but I think when we see equality in the statistics with no regard to ethnicity or gender, and then we see inclusivity uh, in our boardrooms and in our whole ecosystem, uh, that's in our governmental agencies and everywhere. When we see that, I think that is part of the solution. And, um, you know, Harold was speaking to the fact of, of, of the all-inclusive holistic approach that city is taking, not just capital, but also talent. And that supply chain to me is key. Um, the vision and the strategies are created in the boardrooms uh, in, inside of our governmental agencies. And when we get every business um, from every sector inside of that supply chain, 
then the money will multiply itself and it will trickle down into the communities uh, and create the impact that we need. For instance, um, I know we've been talking to city about a lot of different initiatives. And one of the things that we can do, and this is not just for our bank, but this is for all um, businesses of color. You get them in the supply chain, they're gonna create the capital that they need and they're gonna multiply those inside the community, but they've gotta get the opportunity to be inside the supply chain. For instance, um, just treasury, for example. Um, you have all of the large banks inside of that ecosystem and supply chain. You've got to get some, you know, uh, MDIs and, and banks of color inside of that so we can be a part of the solution of moving money around, but we also can reap some of the benefits and, put, and trickle this into our community. So I keep talking about the supply chain, but that's extremely important and the inclusivity inside of the boardroom so that we get the right perspectives and we create the right policies and the right strategies. And it has to be a strategy. It can't, again, be a policy statement. It's got to be a, a strategy. And we all know that we take strategy and we put um, metrics to them and we look for measurable outcomes. And so I think for me, um, it's done. When I see that equality in these statistics and I see a supply chain that looks like America. Great answers, all of you. Really appreciate your thoughtful answers. Now. You're going to be mad at me, but I, I, I've got to ask you this question because I testified every week in July before Congress uh, about this. There are 50 white entrepreneurs for every black entrepreneur. And what I heard you saying was we have to, we have to make sure that they're being served, that there's got to be equality as, as Cynthia was saying. But how do you close that gap when the entrepreneurs that are going to be most affected by this pandemic are black and Hispanic? How do we, how do, we do that? How do we bring them back? Anybody can take the, the question. I'll put a, a uh, perspective on this, Lisa. I think, frankly, it, it begins with access to capital. Right. We have to make sure that young entrepreneurs can realize their dreams because they have a way to be able to achieve them. Right. So, you know, it and being able to have access to those are through financial institutions that serve those communities. That's that's part of the problem, you know, largely is that, you know, if you're if you're in a bit of a bubble, and you can't see outside of the bubble uh, into another community. Uh, then, you know, it just, it makes the problem worse, I think. And so I think to the, to the extent, and there are a lot of moving parts around it, I, I understand, but I think at the very heart of it, if we're able to uh, get, help our young entrepreneurs with programs, with how to put together great business plans, you know, a lot of programs that I know Harold's organization is focused on, Harold P's organization is focused on, uh, and then, but and then give them fair access to capital. That is really the key, so that they can have an opportunity to uh, to realize those dreams. I think that's where it starts. Okay, so we have just about twenty seconds left. Harold P, you want to uh, have the the final word? We we subscribe to a simple equation that pulls together a lot of uh, the focus here. That if we invest in the knowledge capital and social capital mm -hmm. of entrepreneurs of color, then financial capital will be more catalytic. And so we have to take a comprehensive approach, bringing advisory, uh, chain access that Cynthia was talking about, and pairing that with capital so that collectively all three can be catalytic for uh, entrepreneurs of color. Thank all three of you. This has been a fantastic panel. Thank you, Harold Butler, Harold Pettigrew, and Cynthia Day. You all were fantastic. Thank you so much for joining this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Wonderful job. Thank well, you, Lisa.